talk about Ori. Alright, so listen, in 2015 and in 2020, two of my favorite games have came out. Ori in the Blind Forest and Ori in the Well of the West. Two absolute bangers, okay? No complaints, really. Okay, well, you know, that's an overstatement. Anyways, point is that these games are extremely jaw-dropping and great. They have phenomenal soundtracks, amazing graphics. Jesus Christ, the art's so good. And it's just, it's just the definition of, this is a good game, but... The only reason it kind of sucks is because the sequel slams the original. You know, it's just like one of those, which it rarely happens because the sequel usually sucks. But you know what? Who? Forget that. It's just, uh, it's great. Anyways, the point is, is it, it's phenomenal. The game's great. There's literally, we're going to have such a ball here today. So anyways, without wasting any more time, let's start talking about one of the games, Ori and the Blind Forest. So, Ori and the Blind Forest, the original. This game kicks off with a pretty long cutscene that just kind of introduces you to the world and the characters. It introduces the only four characters in the game, Naro, Gumo, Ori, and Koru. After it all plays through, Naru finds Ori basically half dead. Now, you're probably wondering, what does this mean? They create the best mother and son dynamic I think I've ever seen in anything ever. It makes no sense, but it works. Now, after that plays, you finally get to play the game. You finally get to see what this game has to offer and what it's all about. And you know what it has to offer? Doors, enemies, obstacles, and the obvious, the art. Now, you know, these things at first, they don't sound too interesting, but it's all right because, you know, they let you collect green, blue, and orange orbs that make everything better. Oh, God. Now, off the topic of the introduction, after you run around for a little bit, you will start to encounter stuff, one of them being the Ginzo tree. You're going to run into the first and one of the only levels in this game. Now, if this is your first platformer, you might leave this level with severe depression like I did. After sitting in this room for four hours, contemplating my entire existence, going from portal to portal, like, seriously, who came up with this level? design. Oh. After all of that, you beat it. I was so excited to be done this level. And then I got there, restored the light, and you know what happened? The entire room started shaking, and I found out the hard way that rush levels are in this game. Once again, with this being my first platformer, this rush level was probably one of the hardest things I've ever experienced. This was one of the roughest nights of my life. I found out the hard way what a rush level was. I also found out the hard way how to die 300 times during it. Out of my 1,500 deaths, a third of them probably came from this. Once you beat it, you finally meet the bird of the hour, Koro. You get introduced to our main villain. The big bad. The bird. The fucking bird. Man, after he almost basically kills you, we meet another character. Even though we've already been introduced to him, but we really get to see him. We meet Gumo. Everything's gonna be fine now because Gumo's involved. That's a lie. Now that we're done talking about the Ginzo tree and I'm done experiencing those awful, awful fucking flashbacks, let's start chatting about that in-between gray period that you experience between level 1 and level 100 because those are the only two levels that matter. Listen, I played this game about 16 months ago, so I don't really remember much about this little gray area in between level one and 100. I just don't remember struggling that much in this point. But what I do remember is just fighting, running around, doing puzzles, and doing whatever I could. It's, it's like a sandbox. But after you do that, you will eventually find yourself at the frozen gates of Forlorn Runes. You walk into this amazing level. It doesn't look like much, but you go around, you do some parkour, you fix some things. You're like maintenance of this area. You get it all done, and then boom, you're stuck at a gate. If you didn't collect the pieces, you're gonna be very sad. But if you did, you go right through, there's no problem. Now, you put the light down in this little bowl, and we just go on. We go to the next area. You do the exact same stuff you just experienced, and then you're there. You're at the end of the level, is what I would like to say. But we all remember Gumo. We see a cutscene with Gumo, sly ass walk into the runes, and go and steal the light, causing the entire place to explode, activating another rush level. Now, probably thinking to yourself, A, Gumo's a fucking asshole, or B, Gumo's a fucking asshole. So, after you run through this rush level, honestly for no reason, because Gumo's bitch ass wanted to be greedy, at the end of this, you enter Koro's nest. You're either thinking one of two things. 
I'm about to get my shit rocked, or that's a cool bird egg. <coughs> Karu has a cutscene that's dedicated to him, and he has a whole epiphany in this moment, and then he starts to trail you. He's on your ass. But you know Koro's signature move by now. He just throws you off of a very tall place, and you start back at ground level zero. But this time, we have to sneak past him, so that's cool. Now, after you sneak past Koro and you go through all of that experience, we end up in a different level. I don't even remember what it's called. I don't care to look it up either. I just remember I fucking hated it. Dude, this place literally gave me night terrors. It was by by far the most unenjoyable experience I've had probably in any game. Anyways, back to the main point. After you're done that level and you basically just explore the map a little bit, you'll end up back at the gates of Haru. Grew this part. So I bet you can't guess what I'm about to say or what I'm about to tell you that this level parkour, fight, puzzle, kill. If you couldn't have guessed that, you haven't been paying attention. I didn't like these rock fire forsaken god I hate these sentry gun turret things. I didn't like those. Now, why didn't I like them? Because they made me consider offing my- Anyways, after you're done that, you reach the light room in Haru. And then whoop the fucking do Karu comes into room in the mood. I bet you couldn't have guessed. This is the final rush level. I never have to experience this again. Until the sequel. Man, this was rough. This was like a rough situation. I guarantee 600 of my 1512 deaths came from this. This was so difficult for me for no reason either. It like literally felt like I was on fucking crocodile. Don't Google that. Anyways, you go through all of this and out of the four or five rush levels, this one was probably the one that made me consider slamming my nuts with a sledgehammer the most. Now, once you get done it, you realize it wasn't that hard. I'm just really bad at the game. But after you complete it, it's the best moment of your life. You've beat the game. You get the final cutscene. But Ori's almost dead, and Naru comes out of the blue. Gumo's doing his own thing, and Koru literally does the most cliche thing he could do ever. Koru decides to do a self-sacrifice move, literally killing himself with a Rustin Shuriken. Now, once this cutscene's done playing, you're faced with one of two choices. You either uninstall the game, or you go ahead and 100% it. I uninstalled- so after you're done, you're gonna sit there and reflect. What makes a good game? Good graphics? Yeah, sure. Good soundtrack and character build and level design and I can go on and on and on, but I'm not gonna do that because I don't want to. Was this a good game? Absolutely. Did it have its issues? As every game does. Now, standalone, I would give this game a, probably a 9 out of 10. But then I played the sequel right after and it completely ruined this game for me because of how much potential it had and what it didn't do. So at the end of it, I decided to give the game like seven and a half out of 10 just because it didn't do shit compared to the other one. The next installation in this series builds off of everything that you like in this game. So we're gonna start talking about that with it being Ori and the Will of the Wisp. All right, let's talk about the better game now, Ori and the Will of the Wisp. This game has so much to offer, and it gives so much already. On the table, it literally gives four times as much as what the Blind Forest gave, so it's already winning. Like the other game, this game kicks off with a very long cutscene, just kind of explaining what's going on in the game and what happened on the five years Moon Studios decided to just leave the world and make this. Ori and Naru and Gumo, they have a family, and wait, 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 wait. They have a pet bird? Damn straight, they kidnapped the other dude's kid. Anyways, after that, you find out that Ori and Ku, they're like best friends, and once Ku learns how to fly, they go on a little flight. Now remember, we're playing a game here, so they need plot. On their flight, Ku goes into a spiral, Ori goes skydiving. Bam, the game starts. Now you're probably wondering, what's so different about this game than the other one? Basically, this game overhauls everything that you loved about the other and adds so much more. We'll talk about it gradually throughout the review, but for now, you just really get to realize that this is an educational experience. Look at the new language I learned. <laughs> Now, in the Blind Forest, the only real leveling is the rush levels. Now, in here, they implement something new. We have boss fights. Within the first 15 minutes, you're fighting a giant wolf with fire. During this fight, all you really do is feel like an Infernape. It's such a cool experience, and then it really gets to showcase what the game's about. As you go on throughout the game, you experience four or five more boss fights, and speaking of this, we should probably get into the first one. Once you enter Qualk's Hollow, dead giveaway, you end up meeting Qualk, a fucking frog. Now, it's a really interesting experience, whether it's because he's a talking frog or just because he's cool as shit. After you're done talking to him, you're sent on a mission to the Luma Pools. This level is awesome. It's beautiful. It, it's really one of the main showcasers of this game just to see how vibrant and pretty it is. You reach the end of the stage and... Wait, 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 wait. We have to fight the dude? So once you and Qualic meet, he literally just turns into a squid frog. Dude gets taken over by the Kraken. I spent about 45 minutes just getting my ass beat here before I beat him, and then he, he just he just goes away. He's just gone. Like, he's just gone. I lied. He killed the dude. Do you have arachnophobia? Bro, who wrote this shit? Read it! 
Anyways, this is really like the only point in the game where I was just kind of like, eh. You end up in a spider nest. First of all, I hate spiders. Second of all, this is stupid because you have to run around the map to find light to even go in the place. Other than that, there isn't really much to this place. I mean, you fight a giant spider. That's that's about it. I mean, like, yo, what's up? Shout out Mora, my honey mama. But like, other than that, it's just like, who really liked Mora the spider? Now, we've entered one of my personal favorite parts of this game. Bar's Reach. First of all, bear. Great idea. Great execution. I could jerk this level off all day. This was by far one of my favorite parts of the game, if not my favorite part of the game. I loved everything it had to offer between the art vibes, the, the enemies, the puzzles. It was like the, the perfect level. It felt like I was in a dream, but bar itself was such a great idea. Anyways, what was even cooler was the fact that I didn't have to put a knife through my guy's chest. All we had to do was go up to the top of some mountain and then bam, we're introduced to our main villain of this game, Shriek, a deformed concrete crutch bird. Anyways, once he shows up, we're back to the blind forest traumas. We're in a rush level now. We just have to kind of go. After talking about Bar's Reach, we should probably move on to Shriek's Domain, aka the Feeding Grounds. But a little before we tackle that, we should probably tackle a little bit of backstory for the guy so you actually know stuff about him. Basically, when the woods were decaying, this bird was born, and boom, he has concrete on his head and the concrete crutches. Other than that, there's not much to him. He just has dead parents. So he's basically Batman. Now, back to the Feeding Grounds. Now, here's a fun fact about me. I'm scared of literally anything and everything, so walking into this, all I heard was some scary-ass noise that sounded a little a little bit like this. Other than that, all we really do is just kind of sneak by him and see his dead parents as like a statue. It's just, we're just hanging out. During all of this, we reunite with Koo, by the way, and then he literally just gets cucked and killed and like comatose again. So they reintroduce the character to re-extraduce. That's not a word. You get what I'm trying to say though. He just, he's just gone for the rest of the game. Now, after you're done that level and you're done going through all the deep, dark, depressing levels, you will enter a desert level. What's this place called again? Oh, Windswept Waste. Gotcha. This place was pretty cool. There was a lot more slam bam action and you, your bunny dog drill character literally just, he just becomes a construction worker and starts going through everything. So that's awesome. Once you're done being a drill though, you reach a temple. This was awesome. Another feature I haven't really mentioned too much is the fact that you can't just walk into this level. It's intended to be a last destination for a point or something to work up to. At every level you've encountered prior, you'll collect a wisp and you need four to enter this room. But once you go into this temple, it's basically lore central for Ori and everything else that you've been shown in this game. You get a cool history lesson tossed at you and a lot of information and I'm pretty sure they even mention something about Ori species. I, I still don't know what animal this dude is by the way. I mean I have like my guesses but other than that I'm like kind of brainless. Once you're done exploring this temple you have to remember what game you're playing. Something's about to go wrong. A giant worm starts going after you igniting another rush level. I just want to be done with this mechanic. Thankfully though it wasn't too hard. So you tend to complete this one pretty quickly and then you move on to the next. The end level now listen, before we end this review soon, I want to talk about the combat real quick because I didn't address it at all in Blind Forest because I was saving it for this. Blind Forest's combat wasn't anything really special. It was kind of just press B and run around. Will of the Wisp gives you a total overall. Now, let me let me say this now. If you were a hammer user and you're watching this video, I love you a lot. Other than that, there's not really much else I want to mention about it besides the combat was something memorable in Will of the Wisp opposed to where it was just a feature or a mechanic in the Blind Forest. There's not many complaints I have here. I think this was one of the best things implemented into the game was all of it, especially the hammer. We're at the end of the game. We're on the last level. We reach Willow's End. Very purple level. It's almost like Mount Haru, just purple. It's literally just parkour and rooms. It's basically a copy and paste of Haru is what it feels like. You go around every room and it has a little portion of tree decay that you have to purify and then bam, once you do that, you're done this level. You're on the final boss fight, but you can imagine what happens. Shriek pulls the hell up. Now, if you want me to be honest, this level was just kind of underwhelming compared to the rest of the game. This boss fight was literally first try for me. It was, wasn't was that hard. I just kept spamming my hammer. Hammer main for the win. I mean, there's not much to really say about this level. It was just really easy at the end of the day. I mean, if you haven't played it, just go play it. It's just a pretty easy level. Anyways, after you finish this, though, you've beaten the game. But the final cutscene kicks in. Shriek has been beaten. He just goes ahead and dies with his dead parents? Or he makes the ultimate top G move and just literally sacrifices himself and becomes Becomes a tree. Or he becoming one with the light was probably the best thing he could have done here, honestly, because Ku makes a speedy recovery and Gumo and Naru come onto the island now. They all live here. They all gradually just take care of Ori's tree and he lives on like that. I totally didn't 
cry here, by the way. The game's over. You're left with a cliffhanger to leave the door kind of open. It ends the exact same way the original game started, which is a leaf falling off a tree. Do I know if they're going to make a third game? I don't know. Moon Studio makes one game every 10 years. So, it's anyone's guess. An honorable mention to a feature I really liked in this game, by the way, was the NPC interaction in this little village that you could just gradually start building and making and interact with. It was a super cool feature. Realizing that this is one of the best pieces of gaming history I think I've ever touched, it makes me think this was probably the best game I've ever played. In fact, I bet he even won Game of the Year. The Game of the Year award goes to The Last of Us Part 2. Never mind, but I, I, I bet it was nominated. Whatever. Shit's rigged anyway. Oh, oh, one more thing before we get into the actual rating. Whoever decided to add automatic saving instead of soul links, I love you. You deserve a promotion. Ori and the Will of the Wisps set the bar extremely high for every game that came to follow that I played. I really have no complaints about this game. Unlike the first one where it was just a lack addition, this one, there was honestly the perfect amount. So I would say that this game is perfect or really close. I would give it a 10 out of 10. Honestly, I really don't have a complaint about it. It was a phenomenal game. I could sit here all day to talk about it, but we're out of time now today. So the honest truth about the Ori franchise is that it's a phenomenal piece of video game history and I would recommend it to anybody. And here's an even a bigger pro. I only died 379 times in this game.